oh my gosh, I wish people would realise that there are much better ways to be a disability ally than trying to fix a person's disability. It would, oh, it would, it would just save so much oxygen if we didn't have to have these conversations. Like I'm from Yorkshire, I would genuinely rather talk about the weather than like the complexities mm-hmm. of my chronic illness and how they may or may not be healed by alternative therapies that cost the earth and usually don't really do anything. Although I know they do for some people and that's totally valid, but Honestly, I've I've had people banging gongs over me. I've it's and I'm still like this. <laughs> so it doesn't it doesn't work for everybody. Pippa, welcome to Disabled and Proud. How are you today? Oh, I'm good, thank you. Thank you for having me. I was just mentioning it is a bit of a fatigue day, so I'm not at my best, but I'm really looking forward to chatting with you today. And I'm so looking forward to having you here. This has been a long time in the making. So I'm genuinely so excited about having this conversation. I think it'll be really good and really interesting. Fingers crossed. <laughs> I'm not so on my the first... <laughs> Oh, honestly, don't worry about that though, because I think that also shows the reality of disability. And if we weren't being like our true selves as who we are, like right in this very second, this point in time, then it would be a disservice to everybody else. So... Like, this is what we do. We roll with the punches. That's so true. Yep, I, we will go with that. <laughs> <laughs> so the first question I ask absolutely everybody is how do you refer to your disability? I tailor my answer depending on who's asking a lot of the time. Uh-huh. But in a nutshell, I say I have a chronic illness called ME. It's sometimes mm-hmm. known as an energy limiting condition. And it is a neurological condition that affects various dis- different systems in the body but the main symptoms are things like fatigue chronic pain noise and light sensitivity Mm -hmm. and something called post-exertional malaise which is where you do an activity at one point in time and it leads to a worsening of your symptoms in the days or weeks afterwards as kind of like payback I suppose um so it's something that has to be managed really carefully wow what you said about the fatigue and the sorry what was it post post-exertional malaise yep that that is something that I think blows my brain a bit because it like you said it's almost like that payback like haha you did so well for a day and now I'm gonna get you (laughs) that's it and the thing is it's not always just the physical stuff either sometimes if it's like Mm -hmm. mental exertion or even like emotional energy if you've been particularly happy or excited or sad all of those things can have a knock-on effect as well so it's definitely a learning curve learning how to balance that and I'm like 10 plus years in and I still get it wrong. So it's not the easiest skill, but when you can get it right, it does make a significant difference. Yeah, and you said you're 10 years in. Now, in my very ignorant brain, I always considered ME to be something that people past the age of like 45 were diagnosed with. And clearly that isn't the case. Mm -hmm. It's wild really how many younger people get it. So... I've had my diagnosis 10 years, but I actually started with the symptoms four years before that. So I was about 14, 15 when the symptoms started. Um, And yeah, it does seem to affect a lot of younger girls in particular. And the interesting thing Mm -hmm. is that a lot of us come from very specific backgrounds where we've been very sporty or active in the past. Um, So pre illness, I was training as a professional dancer. I was at a ballet school, um, Mm -hmm. had a very different pace of life. but the onset of symptoms it didn't just happen overnight it was quite slow so for a long time i didn't Mm -hmm. fully realize what was happening um and like lots of younger people i think perhaps we're a little bit less visible in that sense because a lot of us have the same experience of going to the gp over and over again and trying to explain what's happening and not quite having the words or the vocabulary for it um but yeah it's it's wild how many younger people are affected and it's um it's definitely more of a female coded illness, it seems, but it affects people from all ages, all backgrounds, all genders. Um, everybody, I was going to say everybody's susceptible. That sounds like a bit of a threat, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> it will happen to you or it could happen to you. <laughs> it's coming for you. It's coming for you. But it's, that is genuinely fascinating, particularly what you said about a lot of people having similar backgrounds. Because the idea of being like super sporty or like super active and then almost for your body not to keep up with what your mind wants to do, 
Now, I know what it's like to be a really sporty person. Like, I love CrossFit, as we all know. And the idea of not being able to do that for like two weeks kind of scares me because I know how important it is for my mental health, for like my physical health. Like it's it's how I socialize with my friends. And as you said, you were what, like 14, 15, 16, some super formative years there. And I was wondering if you could just, if it's not too much of a like traumatic thing to try and talk about, but could we dive into what that experience was like where you had to almost dial back how active you were, particularly at that age? Yeah, for sure. I mean, it's easy to answer because I was in denial for so long. So yeah. during those formative years, even though those symptoms were there and they were progressively getting worse, I was very much of the belief that what I was experiencing was in my head or it was my problem. Mm -hmm. um, when you're told so many times that you just need to push through and you just need to do this and you need to try harder and not be a malingerer you do very much take the onus for all of your suffering on you. And when you do yeah. that, you kind of think, well, if I'm the problem, then I just need to be a bit more determined and I just need to push a bit harder. Um, whereas what I know now is that's the worst thing you can do. Yeah. Um, but during those teenage years, right up until I got the diagnosis, I was trying to rebel against it with all my might. And I also think mm -hmm. as well, there's sometimes this narrative that like successful disabled people are the ones who overcome everything and it's all like mind over matter. Yes. Um, and mm -hmm. I very much wish that was the case. And if that was true, I don't think I would be ill right now. And I don't think a lot of people would be ill right now. Yeah. Um, so it was like, it was, it was a very weird time, but yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't particularly difficult at that age mentally because I was in denial physically. It was very, very difficult, but mentally I still mm -hmm. really thought the problem was me. So I wasn't really, I didn't yeah. feel like I was living with a disability or living with a chronic illness at that point in time, even though I know now that I was. Yeah. Gosh, that is like to be in denial about your own body is hard work and I think it's something that everybody has experienced if you have a disability because at some point it's a bit like it's not really like it's not really a problem if I don't think about it too hard it's not a problem or you know like oh I don't have to go and see the doctor I just need to push through and, and actually like you said that can quite often be the exact opposite of what you should do and to have that experience, particularly as, as a female or someone who presents as female is really difficult because you have so many um, judgmental forces around you when that comes to the media and, you know, you're young. So you have parents and then you have school friends and then you have teachers and, and there's everybody almost telling you exactly how you should be. And, you know, you're like, you're too young and you're too active and oh no, like it's just, you just push through or have some more protein powder. That type of thing must like, it's a lot. It's a lot to deal with. And something that you said that I found really interesting then, you said, you know, mentally you didn't see yourself as having a disability because you couldn't put two and two together, which is absolutely fine because we all go through that. But actually, you know, like physically there was something else that was going on. And what was the type of physical symptoms that you were experiencing? So at that time, I felt like I constantly had the flu. Um, it was that okay. sort of like illness malaise where you just wake up in the morning and you think, oh, I feel so ill. And it's like really a real struggle mm -hmm. to get out of bed and get up and do what you need to do. The other unique one, and I, I still don't know if this was the ME or if this was just unique to me. I had this pain behind my eye, this really severe head pain. And it kind of mm. sat just here and it was constantly there and it would always get worse whenever I did overdo it or I overexerted it. Um, and I just basically think my body was under a lot of stress. Um, it was like, I'd what, bearing in mind, I used to train in ballet. I used to do 10 hour, yeah. very intensive days. I'd walk up a flight of stairs at school and it would absolutely exhaust me and I would struggle yeah. to do it. Um, so it was like, it was all of this stuff and trying to manage it while on the outside, I still look like just any other person. I genuinely mm -hmm. don't think you would be able to tell just from looking at me what I was experiencing. And because I had yeah. all of this doubt and insecurity, I wasn't really verbalizing it that much at the minute either. None of my school teachers knew what was going on. Only a handful of my closest friends knew what was going on because I still didn't feel as though I had the right to talk about it. Like yeah. right up until I got the diagnosis, I didn't feel as though I was allowed to use any of those labels or actually talk about something as if it was actually a recognized medical condition I didn't have that um that assurance yet I suppose mm -hmm. yeah 
And actually, as you said, like up until your diagnosis, that's when you kind of started to 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 use language and, and kind of form your own like language to, to how to talk about it. And, and I was wondering, what was the diagnosis period like? Because as you said, it is very female coded. Like I like I was very ignorant in terms of me saying, you know, I only thought, you know, older people seem to be diagnosed with this. What was that experience like for you as a young female to go through that and try and almost like have these conversations with doctors and not feel like you were battling all the time? I don't know if you can still hear me, but I've lost you a bit. Did you hear the question? Do you want me to start again? 50% of the question so maybe start again (laughs) (laughs) today the internet is doing its own thing so if it drops in and out just let me know and we can pick up from wherever we are what I was saying was to be a young female who as we've already said Emmy is very female coded it's something that I ignorantly thought was, you know, only older people got diagnosed with. What was the experience of getting a diagnosis like? And and we've already kind of touched on medical misogyny, but, but what was that like at that age? I really think if there hadn't been as much misogyny and as much gaslighting, I think I would have got that diagnosis sooner. And I do think that mm-hmm. my entire condition trajectory could have been so different if I'd had that diagnosis earlier. Um, yeah. Prior to that point, for four years, I had been going to the GP over and over again and trying to explain. And they would often come back and say, oh, it's probably just teenage hormones. You're probably just stressed over exams. Um, Try going for an hour long walk every day after school because you probably just need to build up your stamina. Again, bearing in mind, I used to be a ballet dancer. Mm -hmm. Um, So when it got to a point where this is a whole other story. I was working in Greece as a kid's holiday rep because again, I was in denial. Uh Um, I had a full on relapse in Greece. That was the moment when the flip, when the switch flipped and that Mm -hmm. was when my symptoms got so much worse. Um, So I flew home from there and my mum actually came into the GP appointment with me and she basically said, I'm not leaving until we have some sort of plan or action here because she's not okay. Mm -hmm. And that was what it took to get the referral to a specialist. Um, So I was 19 years old at that point. I got the, I got the referral. I got diagnosed almost instantly, which again is quite rare because it's a diagnosis Mm -hmm. of exclusion. It often takes a very long time to rule stuff out. Um, But getting that diagnosis, it was actually quite validating in some ways because it was the Mm -hmm. first time I kind of let myself consider oh my gosh I was right like my instinct was right when for so long you felt as though you're the problem and your gut was telling you the wrong thing it was like oh my gosh I was right all along Um, and no matter the all the struggles that came after that like I really think having that diagnosis was a big turning point for me Mm -hmm. and I love what you said about it almost being self-validating and it's like I knew I was right I knew there was something going on I knew I wasn't this like quote-unquote weak person particularly like you said if you've got the stamina to be able to do 10 hour days and then all of a sudden it's almost like you can't push through that's not about a a, like a lack of willingness there is something else going on here Mm -hmm. and like I'm 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 really sad that your mum had to come in and help you but I can also can completely understand that because there have been multiple times where my mum's had to come into a doctor's appointment to be like, you're wrong. <laughs> and sometimes it, do, it does take that, but I'm sorry that you had to experience that and, and not be listened to because there is nothing worse than trying to scream about a problem that you have and nobody listens, particularly when we're talking about medicine, because at the end of the day, people who are into medicine <laughs> want to help people and if you can't help you probably shouldn't be in that role <laughs> like, I agree. Straight I agree. <laughs> yeah for sure and I think like I say it's definitely not a problem that's unique to me it still happens mm-hmm. so much I think things are slowly changing I think medical education is improving with regard to less visible conditions but it yeah. definitely still happens and it's definitely a problem that needs more attention than it gets at the minute yeah for sure so when it comes to the, like, you got diagnosed at, what, 18, 19. So that's yeah. super young. But also an incredibly formative part of your life when you decide if you're going to go to uni or if you're going to go to college or if you're just going to go into the working place. And I was wondering when you get this, like, fresh diagnosis combined with what am I going to do with my life now that school's kind of over? 
what was that experience and how did that impact what you went on to do? So the timeline for me was I went for my first year of uni while I was still in that state of denial. So just before I got the diagnosis, I did one year of uni, Uh absolutely loved it. It was like the best year ever. I was being typical type A personality. I was doing all of the studies, all of the societies. I was on the dance team. I was on the trampolining team. We were winning competitions. And then that summer was the year I flew to Greece and had the relapse. So it was almost Mm. like I left my first year of uni as one person and I returned as a totally different person. Um, So from my second year onwards, I spent most of the day in bed. Um, I was able to be out of bed for maybe like a couple of hours in the day for studying and maybe an hour or two in the evening to spend time with housemates. Um, It was a real struggle to stay in uni and to get my degree. I did manage to do it, but I had to sacrifice most of the student experience in order to do that. Mm. Um, And then, like you said, I graduated and I thought, well, what on earth happens now? Because... By that point, I had started learning how to manage the condition. So I was doing okay. And I didn't have the same level of cognitive decline that a lot of other people have. So I found Mm -hmm. myself in this position where I'm thinking, I'm well enough to do something. I'm well enough to work in some capacity, but I'm definitely not well enough to work full time, to be commuting to an office, to have that sort of traditional employment experience. Mm -hmm. Um, so from there, I ended up doing a year of a master's degree, um, because I genuinely didn't know what else I could do. I did apply for a few jobs, but this was long before the lockdown. So even the idea of working from home was something that a lot of people scoffed at. Um, there were very few opportunities like that. Um, but it took a lot of diligence in my, like, eventually I managed to kind of worm my way into the charity sector. Um, I got an internship Mm -hmm. at a disability charity and even though it was like tremendously difficult, that kind of set me on this path of trying to find ways of working and ways of pursuing my goals in a way that Mm -hmm. would work alongside my condition management and all of the intricacies of that. So I am very much one of the fortunate ones who can work, but I do it in a quite a unique way. Um, And it's Mm -hmm. taken time, but I have learned to see that as actually one of my biggest assets as well. Yeah, I bet. And particularly like when you graduate, I don't, it doesn't matter who you are and if you're disabled or non-disabled like everybody goes to that like what the hell do you do now because suddenly like for the last three years life I think it was really funny when we talk about uni because people are like oh you know like it's your first stepping stone into real life I'm like university is not real life no you do not go out like you don't go out however many times a week you you definitely don't drink that much in real life or if you're not a drinker you're not that active like I don't care (laughs) (coughs) and also you're not just tailoring yourself around like oh I've got to get up for like a two-hour lecture you know like real life is like I've got to get up because I've got to go to work and I've got to do stuff and and actually it's quite funny because you, you do get to the graduation point and you're like oh my god like this now is real life and and actually where do we go from here so it's nice to hear that you had that same experience all right we had disability like mingled in with that but actually it's not a unique experience in the terms of like we've all felt like that and that's that is like solidarity in that I think and did I see as well that did you go to uni of York as well yeah I did yeah and it's like such I mean I don't know if you had the same experience as me but it's such like a community feel it's like the campus it's like you're very much in this like bubble and although again Mm -hmm. there's always challenges for every student but it did feel like this nice sort of bubble like secure like you felt very safe in the city so yeah I completely get what you mean you come out of it and it's like oh god what am I doing (laughs) yeah like York as a university is And I I say this to everyone, York was my favourite place and still is my favourite place in the entire world. Like the university just have it so right when it comes to how they do colleges and how they foster community and the clubs that they have. And and like the town itself is is really safe. Like it is. And it's a great it's a great university town to be a part of. So I know exactly what you mean. You come out of it and you're like, I don't really want to go to London. London seems a bit scary or like even Leeds and you're like oh Leeds is a bit big <laughs> in comparison because York is so teeny tiny <laughs> I know it's so cute. I love it I actually stayed in York after uni so I've lived there ever since and I actually worry that I'm too settled sometimes because I absolutely love it again not the easiest as a wheelchair user cobbles everywhere but I absolutely yeah. love it. it's just got good vibes 
Oh, I like I so I'm really lucky. I get to go to York quite often because my best friend still lives there, and then my cousins also all live around York as well. And so I'm up there at least like a couple of weekends of a month. And every time I'm up there, I'm like, I just love it here so much. Like, there's so many good things to do. But actually, like you said, not necessarily the most accessible place for a wheelchair user because of the cobbles, because it has like absolutely no parking in the city centre. Like, yes. <laughs> it is, it's not necessarily like the most accessible place, which is a problem, but it's not one that I'm going to take on right now. <laughs> yeah, that's it. You have to pick your battles. Yeah, exactly. Exactly that. And actually, whilst we're on the subject of like moving forward with life, so you now write, which I love. I think there's something really fabulous about being able to share written word. And I think that's how we learn and how we grow. But what made you get into like blogging and then sharing your writing and also your book? (laughs) Yeah, it's honestly having writing as part of my life now is like probably one of the greatest privileges. I feel so lucky, especially because I've always been a writer I never Mm -hmm. thought I would be lucky enough to do it as my job one day but even when I was little I was like writing stories I was writing diary Mm -hmm. entries I used to write like I used to write scripts for my favorite tv shows I used to just write my own episodes for them and it was just something that I love to do um Mm -hmm. and then it took a bit of a backseat when my health started declining but after I got my diagnosis I was there thinking well what on earth happens now? Like you're given Mm -hmm. like a handful of leaflets and then it's like, right, off you go, you figure out the rest for yourself. Um, And it was at that point that I kind of turned to the online chronic illness community. I discovered Mm -hmm. it kind of by accident, but I think it was seeing other people, especially people who were a more similar age and people who I could better relate to. Mm -hmm. I was seeing people using social media to share their stories. And I just found so much comfort in that. I learned so much from reading about other people's experiences. And it was seeing other people writing about their stories that kind of prompted me to want to do the same. So Mm -hmm. I started off sharing stuff on Instagram. And then a few years later, I started my blog. Um, And it's almost every incredible thing that's happened in my life from that point onwards has been because I started a blog. It completely changed my life. And just having that space to write and just talk about what I was going through and share the stuff that I would have found helpful back then and the stuff that could perhaps help other people Mm -hmm. everything stemmed from there um and that's kind of what gave me the springboard to kind of go into freelance writing and then later writing books as well um so it's just wild how one little decision especially that one I decided to start my blog on a night when I had insomnia I couldn't sleep and I was like I'm gonna start a blog and it's just like wow if I hadn't done that my life could look completely different to how it does now those are my favorite types of moments because quite often when you think about something on a whim and then you just do it quite often the best results come from it because you haven't thought about it too much you've just done it and, you and there's a lot to be out of it <laughs> yeah that literally that point is that you haven't been able to sit there and be like oh maybe not or maybe I won't or, or I don't think I'm good enough like you just you just kind of get on with it and do it and actually that's probably served you so well because you've been able as you say to like freelance write and and also write write books and what I love is that you've written a book all about chronic illness now I'm not going to take away from it because it's your book it's your baby but I would love it if you could talk a bit more about how that idea came about and what was that writing experience like particularly in terms of having ME because like you said it's a fatigue-based illness and writing can take up a lot of like mental capacity. And as you said, you can sometimes get that. What was it? Post-exertion malaise? Yeah, post-exertional malaise. I think you nailed that. <laughs> yes. What <laughs> di- What was that like? Because uh, obviously being very assumative here, at some point may- you probably experienced that because, you know, writing does take mental load. Absolutely, it does. And even on my best days, I only had a maximum window of one to two hours a day where I was well enough to write. And even that would require rest and recovery afterwards. Mm -hmm. But the thing I always, this is only a personal theory. I've got nothing to back this up, but (laughs) I think 
people's different skill sets dictate what drains the most energy out of them. So a lot mm -hmm. of people could write a paragraph and it would absolutely floor them. Whereas because writing is one of the things that comes more naturally to me, mm -hmm. I feel like I have more of an ability to do it with the limited energy that I have. Whereas somebody else mm -hmm. might be incredible at sort of like numerical things and like maths and like completing forms and spreadsheets. And they might mm -hmm. be able to sit and do that for a couple of hours. Whereas I could do a few lines of that and I'd be ready to like just completely throw in the towel and call it a day yeah um, so I do think the fact that writing is one of the skills that comes naturally to me I think that definitely helped me but throughout the whole time like careful planning and preparation and pacing was so important if you ever overdid it that would wipe out the next few days so you had to mm -hmm. be really careful um planning in advance was really important so my least favorite part of writing is getting the structure right but I found that the more time you spend on that, the easier it gets further down the line. Mm -hmm. um, but I think as well, this particular book, it's called How to Do Life with a Chronic Illness. And it felt so natural to write because it just follows this process that I've been over over the last decade where I wanted to talk not really about the medical side of living with a chronic illness, because that's the thing that often dictates the conversation. Like mm -hmm. there's some great resources out there about like symptoms and like medication and managing from that perspective. But I wanted to write a book that kind of explored how somebody could make the most out of the rest of life. So how they could mm -hmm. go about things like friendships and socializing and dating and rediscovering your identity yeah. and adapting your hobbies and interests and how to lean into that side of life while also accommodating your symptoms and never playing down the fact that you have an energy limiting condition. Um, so I think the fact that my own experiences meant that all of this information was stored in the back of my brain anyway, when it came to yeah. sitting down and writing, it all just kind of came out. Um, mm -hmm. And I really, really enjoyed the writing process, actually. Um, it's wild to think about now, but I wrote the book in four months while doing my other job. <laughs> yeah, people yeah. usually make that face. <laughs> From my, from my like limited knowledge of people writing books, usually it takes like upwards of six months to a year. Yeah, yeah. Four it months was, is so yeah. quick. It was wild. It was wild. But that's the thing. I had to pace it so carefully. Mm -hmm. um, and I do have a flexible schedule because I, I'm a freelancer. So I'm not tied to a really yeah. rigorous schedule. So like I said, just really careful planning in advance was the thing that enabled me to do it. Um, mm. But yeah, I look back now and I think, how on earth did I do that? <laughs> yeah, I bet like my brain just now, the idea, don't get me wrong. I think, like I said, being able to write a book, I think is a really brilliant achievement, like regardless of what your book is about. But being able to sit and write for like an, a, like an extended period of time, whilst I feel like I'd probably have an awful lot to say, because my brain is so like I am very very stereotypical ADHD inattentive and hyperactive all at once I would like get so engrossed and then I'd like see a butterfly and be like oh my gosh I need to go and sort that out or like oh my gosh the the cups in my cupboard need to be completely restacked and I'd completely lose myself and so the idea that someone could write a book in four months <laughs> feels very alien to me because I know for a fact that if it was if it was me I'd be like six months nine months a year plus because someone would have to be like b have you done this now and i'd be like no sorry like had to rearrange my wardrobe <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh no i can totally see it from that point even though i'm neurotypical so completely different situation yeah but i i always enjoyed it once i got started but when i sat down mm. at my desk i would want to do every other thing on my to-do list that wasn't writing the book I would sit yeah. down and think, oh, I'll do this today and I'll do bu the book tomorrow. But if I didn't hold myself accountable, I that's just the way it would have done. And I would have got everything mm -hmm. done except the book. And so yeah. I've always had to like make a conscious effort to remind myself that this is something you enjoy. It's a privilege that you get to do this. Like, mm -hmm. don't put it off. Um, and again, neurotypical perspective, so totally different. But yeah, I, it was just reminding myself that this is a privilege. This isn't something that you have to do. It's something that you get to do. Um, mm -hmm. that was a big part of it for me and like the more I got into it the easier it was to kind of just get into that flow and just keep going and like in in that way I think having quite a tight deadline really helped me because there wasn't room for procrastination it did have to become such a big focus of my life at that point in time 
Yeah, I love what you said about, I'm really lucky that I get to do this and I'm really grateful. I think that's a really beautiful thing to hear because I think sometimes we don't think about that and we're not actually grateful for the situation that we're in right now. Like, all right, being disabled is not the easiest thing in the world. And I'm never going to say that it is, but actually, you know, I get to have these conversations and I wouldn't necessarily have these conversations if I wasn't disabled. I mean, I'd probably still be a loud gobby person, but <laughs> they wouldn't be as interesting. <laughs> But I completely understand that idea of like, actually, you no, know, I, I get to do this. And like, how lucky is that? And I feel very grateful for that. And I think that being able to gratitude for what you're able to do is always a really beautiful thing to be able to do because, you know, like we're only here once and we might as well make the best of it if we can. And that Absolutely. sounds very woo woo, but I do mean it. <laughs> no, for sure. And I suppose the other angle really with my particular chronic illness with ME is it's never lost on me that I'm one of the lucky ones. So the fact that mm -hmm. I can even sit here and chat to you today, a lot of people with ME, my age and younger, some people lose the ability to speak. Some people have to be tube yeah. fed. Some people are completely housebound or bed bound. I have a friend who hasn't been out of her bedroom in I think seven years. And it's wow. like, it's just like, I never want to be seen as somebody who speaks for the whole ME community because I have so mm -hmm. many privileges and it could be so much more severe and I mean I have no idea what my prognosis is like any other person it could yeah. get better it could get worse and I think as much as I wish that wasn't the case it does really make you focus on what you have in the here and now and even mm -hmm. though there are so many challenges and so many struggles like I'm so glad and grateful that I've got to this point now and I really try and make the most out of that without sounding really cheesy and really woo-woo, like you said. Um, but yeah, I do feel very grateful to be here doing this right now. I totally understand it. I'm all about it. I think there's nothing more gorgeous than being able to give back from something that's given you so much, whether it comes up wrapped in this disabled package or not. I think being able to, to recognise that is really phenomenal. And something that I would love to ask you is if you could look back to when you were you know let's say 16 17 you know something's not quite right or as it should be what is a piece of advice that you would give like 16 17 year old Pippa what would you say to her if you could oh my gosh I think I would say keep trying and trust your own voice mm -hmm. It's so easy when you're like, I was never the most assertive person anyway. So when you're in front of an authority figure, like a GP, like yeah. I would always squash down my experience and I would think, well, they know what they're talking about. So mm -hmm. I should listen to them. Um, I think I really doubted my intuition for a really long time. So I would encourage anybody in that situation to just really trust what your body is telling you. Um, yeah and not to be backed into a corner about it. I wish I had mm. known that it's okay to seek a second opinion. And if you're if you're in my situation and you're trying over and over again, take your mum into the appointment if you need to. <laughs> Mums have a way of fighting for you. Do what you need to do to make yourself mm. heard. And don't feel as though you have to give up because searching for answers is doing the compassionate thing for yourself. And it's much better to know and to rule things out than constantly wonder what if, I would say. Something you said there that I think really needs to be highlighted is you said searching for answers is the most compassionate thing that you can do for yourself. Mm -hmm. And actually, that is so true because so often so many people don't necessarily trust their instinct and they just leave it. Or, you know, when they get fobbed off, they think, oh, maybe it's just a me issue. But actually, that's so true that searching for answers is one of the most compassionate things that you can do for yourself. Because like you have said previously, we've spoken about earlier, once you got your diagnosis things kind of changed for you mm -hmm. and actually that change good or bad is actually what's needed if someone feels like they need a diagnosis yeah the more knowledge you have the easier it is to figure out what you're going to do with it and I appreciate there's only so much knowledge you can have with a condition like ME which is so under-researched and so stigmatized mm -hmm. but the more you know the better you can prepare yourself and figure out how to do life in a way that works for you yeah for sure so with all of this experience, you know, you've been a dancer and then you went to uni and then things changed and now you're a writer. Throughout that whole time, what is one positive trait that you've noticed about yourself? Oh, let me think. I, I think 
I... I'm going to have to look at what I wrote down because I made notes earlier and I'm having a really brain foggy day. <laughs> oh, I yeah. love this though. Oh, Perfect. I can. Perfect. <laughs> Honestly, I'm telling you, planning and preparation is the way to go. Um, I think me and you might need to work on this together because I can't plan or prepare for absolutely anything. Like, <laughs> I need to get tips. <laughs> I can't function without it. So we're quite a good match in that sense. Perfect. <laughs> oh, no, no, it's okay. I remember what I said now. I, I um I think one thing that I do like about myself that I wouldn't have necessarily expected would emerge from all of this is I actually think I'm more ambitious now even though I have so much less usable energy per day I feel mm -hmm. as though I've got a stronger desire to do what I can and figure out what I can do with that level of ambition um and I don't know. I was always an ambitious person, but I thought that if I was dealing with a chronic illness, I thought that that would kind of quench it a little bit. Um, yeah. When in reality, it's almost fueled it a bit more, which I thought was quite a strange uh, experience. But I bet I'm not alone in that either. I once heard someone describe it as pain juice, which is like radioactive. <laughs> That's incredible. <gasps> and I was like, actually, it's not wrong because I completely understand that because you almost want to your ambition doesn't just encompass yourself it almost there's almost like a whole other cohort of people that's your community behind you that actually like you're doing it for them as well like when I think about this podcast I'm sure I love having conversations but actually I'm doing it for everybody else who wants to hear them too and that fuels me more so I can completely understand that idea that your ambition is driven almost a bit more by your chronic illness because like you said you know you're, you're writing a book and that book isn't just for one person it's for loads of different people but if one person gets help from that then isn't that amazing you, you know I can completely the way that that works I get it 100% yeah that's so true I like looking at it through that lens as well like I always think I try and write and I try and create the stuff that I wish I'd had back then so the fact mm -hmm. that it wasn't there now if it could be for somebody what I wish I'd had myself like that's such an incredible feeling and it's like mm -hmm. when people message or email to say I love that you said this or like this has really helped me or this is people say this has changed my life this has helped me to see things in a new way it's the feeling that gives you is almost un indescribable so it's like I do think it's important not to do things purely for other people because I've fallen into mm -hmm. that trap in the past but if you're able to do something that fulfills you on a personal level but it also provides support or entertainment or just something of substance for other people I think that's the golden combo and I feel so grateful that I get to kind of explore that and what I can do with it now I always think of it as like a like a ray of sunshine because then you feel like a bit of a ray of sunshine afterwards do you know what I mean like your body does feel like it's like a ray of sunshine because you know how like so nice much. that feels <laughs> oh my gosh I love that so much that's such a gorgeous way of putting it because when you think like when because I know exactly what you mean when you get a message from someone that's like oh this has really helped this situation and you're like that's amazing and I'm so glad that I was able to facilitate that for you and then it's just like a little bolt of sunshine and you're like oh that was me oh. <laughs> like Makes little old me good. did something good <laughs> yeah that's my good deed of the day <laughs> yeah. oh I completely know what you mean that it's the best feeling in the world that lovely like glowy feeling it's like oh this is so lovely yeah yeah <laughs> did, you, did you hear that as well yeah <laughs> It was loud, wasn't it? Oh my God. I, so I have a, dog? <laughs> he's not very big at all. That's the problem. So um, I have, the, my dog is Toto from the Wizard of Oz, like the same oh. breed. <laughs> and that's how loud he is. Oh my gosh. That's incredible. What's his name? He's called Warney. Oh. He's so precious. cute. Everybody always asks me what's it about. And I'm like, then I have to go into this spiel. Only one person I've spoken to understood why I called him Warney. So I loved the cricketer Shane Warne and his nickname was Warney. And I really loved him because he had this one quote and it was, it's not luck, it's attitude. And I think that that really encompasses quite a lot of like really good things in life. So I called my dog after him. And a lot of people are like, oh, what's he called? Winnie? And I'm like, no, it's Warney. It's not hard. <laughs> <laughs> That's so good. Honestly, I'll be honest. The first thought I had when you said Warney was uh, was Warner from Legally Blonde. <laughs> <laughs> Completely frames of reference. <laughs> so <laughs> different. 
<laughs> oh dear. I love that though. Like that took it on a completely different tangent. I mean, I had someone ask me if it was about Winnie the Pooh, and I was like, firstly, his name is not even Winnie; it's Warney. <laughs> Um, and no, like I would not call my dog after Winnie the Pooh. Great character, love him, but it's just not for me. I can't imagine standing in the park shouting Winnie and, and having any form of street cred. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's so true. That's so true. <laughs> Warney is a cute name for a dog, and that's really unique as well. I don't think I've ever heard that before. Yeah, he's he's one in a he's one in a million, as they say. <laughs> oh, I know. He just needs attention. That's all he wants right now. So we're, we're, we're fine. <laughs> Honestly, we've all been there. Who doesn't? <laughs> <laughs> so true. <laughs> Actually, though, when it comes to attention, God, that was such a good segue. Pat myself on the back for that one. Outstanding. When it comes to attention and particularly surrounding disability and particularly like for young females who use any form of mobility aids, there seems to always be some form of unwanted attention when you go out in public. And I was wondering, do you get asked like a specific set of bizarre questions surrounding your disability, like if you go out in public? I do. And I always wonder how they know that my situation is somebody as a chronic illness rather than someone who has a spinal injury or might be paralyzed. It's like people can tell that mm -hmm. I have some sort of illness or that I'm an ambulatory wheelchair user. Obviously, yeah. sometimes they see me standing up or crossing my legs and that even all these years later, that baffles people. They think they're witnessing some <laughs> kind of miracle. Um, but I just get a lot of unsolicited advice. So the question, yeah. the weird question that I get over and over again is any question that starts with, have you tried? So oh, no God. matter what I'm doing, whether I've asked for it or not, people are constantly trying to heal me. People who I've never met before, yeah. they have no idea about my medical history or what I've tried in the past. Um, just, I think the fact that people see a younger wheelchair user, and I'm also aware that I look a lot younger than I actually am. I think mm -hmm. people have this desire to help, but don't realize that their interpretation of helping just makes things so much worse. Mm -hmm. um, so no matter what the situation is, I will have people just like on the bus or like in the queue at the shops or just even people in a work context emailing me say, saying, have you seen this article? Have you tried this? My auntie's sister's friends, dog sitters, cousins, so-and-so did this and now they're completely mm -hmm. better um yeah and you like you learn to laugh at it because you have to you just have to mm. um but oh my gosh I wish people would realize that there are much better ways to be a disability ally than trying to fix a person's disability it would oh it would it would just save so much oxygen if we didn't have to have these conversations like I'm from Yorkshire I would genuinely rather talk about the weather than like the complexities mm -hmm. of my chronic illness and how they may or may not be healed by alternative therapies that cost the earth and usually don't really do anything although I know they do for some people and that's totally valid but honestly I've I've had people banging gongs over me I've it's and I'm still like this <laughs> so it doesn't it doesn't work for everybody genuinely I thought I was going to come out healed and I haven't so but people yeah. will still ask <laughs> But it's, it's almost like that I'm allergic to yoga, don't ask me if I've tried it type vibe because don't get me wrong, I think it can do wonders for some people, but it doesn't work for everyone like you said. And and also something you said there about like wheeling out your like complex medical needs, just because it worked for one person doesn't mean it's gonna work for someone else. But also I don't want to have that conversation with you about my medical needs because actually it's private information that I don't need to share with you. A hundred percent. Like just the other day I was in the shop, I was dropping off a parcel um, and I had a really nice chat with the guy. And then he looks at me and he goes, can I ask you a question? And I thought, oh God, here we go. Um, and he goes, why are you in a wheelchair? Um, and I said, oh, I've got a chronic illness, you know, in the kind of way mm -hmm. that's like, okay, end of conversation. And he was like, do you believe you'll get better? And I thought there's no right way to answer that, com like that question. Um, so I, I did something that I've never done before. I literally just shut up and I didn't say another word. I was like, I'm not even answering because I can't be asked with this today. I'm having a terrible symptom day. I just did not answer. I didn't say another word. I, I just said, thank you. Have a nice day. And then he said, I believe there is always hope. And I thought, oh my God, like, because clearly the thing I needed in this situation was the perspective of a straight, white, non-disabled male. Thank you very much. But it's like, it's just, it's so unnecessary. But actually something that, something that was, I always find interesting about those types of interactions is that quite often it's not for you, it's for the other person. 
So he has said that to feel good about himself. He hasn't actually said that to make you feel good about yourself. And that is kind of where we've fallen into this trap in society of where we almost speak to 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 be heard rather than speaking to be listened to. Hundred percent. And and when it comes to disability, we have to like ingest and hear so much all of the time that sometimes it's actually kinder if you just don't speak. Yeah. I completely get that. It's some a lot of the time the conversation is a one way conversation. Like they're so busy thinking of what they're going to say next and what the the quote unquote right thing is to say or like what their their opinion is on the situation as if they're an enti- as if they're entitled to an opinion about someone's disability. I agree. Sometimes mm-hmm. the best thing you can do is just sit there and just let it go in one ear and out the other where it's possible yeah. to do that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's, it's so it's it's so true. Such fun, isn't it? All fun and games. Honestly, the ableism, when you, I think the funny thing with ableism is, is that we all kind of experience it. But when we actually sit down and talk about it, we realise how absurd it actually is. And if we were to translate it into any other social context, people would be mortified with us to say the certain things that we say, you know. I had it once where someone came over to me and they're like, I'll pray for your arm to come back. (gasps) And I was like... If my arm magically grew back, that would be the worst thing that could ever happen to me into the entire world. And it would be because I don't know how to navigate this world with two hands. Like, I, I genuinely don't. I wouldn't know how to do anything. I would be very confused. I'd be very disconcerting. Also, like, I would then become a medical anomaly. I'd probably be wheeled out onto the medical stage for the entire world to see. It would be a disaster from head to toe. Like that doesn't help me. That's not beneficial for me. No. I would rather you just be like, oh, have a nice day. Thanks, you too. That's it. Although I wish I had an ounce of the self-belief that person had in thinking that they could pray and for your arm to grow back. <laughs> like, Oh, I know. Imagine being a, being so confident in your abilities. <laughs> if, <laughs> Got a personal hotline nice. with the big man. <laughs> I saw this girl and she needs a hand. Please, can you give her one? <laughs> Do your thing, please. Oh my gosh, that is actually horrific. That's so bad. But I completely get what you mean as well. That is just like if you want to direct your energy to doing something about it, like challenge the ableism. Don't try and like quote unquote fix the disability. Figure out how you can be an ally and make the world more inclusive instead. Exactly that. Exactly that. Channel your energy into fighting the system rather than trying to fix the like really minor minor issue that is the fact that I'm disabled think about all the systemic problems we have and direct your energy there please I love that I completely completely agree 100% my brain is going now can you tell (laughs) it's a good thing though I've only got one final question for you and I feel like I know the answer already I have got to say though I've really enjoyed this conversation I've loved hearing about your journey and how you write and I'm genuinely so excited to dive into your book I think it's going to be phenomenal before I ask you the final question where can we find your book if we want to buy it it's available from wherever you like to get your books it's called how to do life with a chronic illness by Pippa Stacey um there are signed copies on my website as well but it's available wherever you normally like to get your books (laughs) amazing and my final question for you Pippa is are you disabled and proud It's taken a blooming long time to get here, but I am in fact disabled and proud. Oh, I love it. And I also love that you said that it's taken you a while to get there because it's not necessarily something that happens overnight. Absolutely. And I've learned now that I can resent the terrible symptoms that I live with, but still have pride in my disabled identity. And I am fully going all in on it now. (laughs) Oh, I love that. Like I said, I've genuinely really enjoyed today. And thank you for giving up your precious time and you know, Prasha's brain capacity to have a little chin wag with me. It's been great and I've loved it. I've really enjoyed it too. And thank you for being so accommodating. I'm honestly not at my best cognitively today, but I've really enjoyed chatting to you. So thank you again for having me. No, no worries. I feel like we've built a friendship now. We're going to be friends forever. So yes, just start with me. <laughs> the books, we've got the books in common. So we're off to a flying start anyway. <laughs> I know. If people, like people obviously can see this if you watch us on YouTube, but we literally have the exact same like background. We both have matching books. We've lined them up by colour, which may be like, be because we're really weird, but who knows? <laughs> got to lean into it. If it brings you joy, you've got to lean into it. It brought me so much joy to do this bookcase. I can't tell you like so much joy (laughs) oh we're gonna get on great honestly this is the start of a beautiful friendship we're on the same page no pun intended you heard it here first (laughs) (laughs) oh i'm gonna let you go but thank you so much for giving up your time i've loved it and it's been great thank you